Sermon, Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 37. Sometimes while preparing a sermon, I find myself challenged with trying to write something new about a story with which we are already so familiar. We heard today that God wants to fill us with knowledge and understanding. But sometimes when we come across a very familiar story, it's easy to take it for granted because we feel we already have our understanding of that text. In our epistle today, we are told by Paul that God wants us to grow in knowledge of God, which tells me that when we have a very familiar text before us, in order to grow in understanding, we have to study the text and not cast it aside simply because we're familiar with it. So that is what we are going to do this morning. You and I are going to honor the words in our epistle by studying together what we heard in our gospel reading. Here we are before the parable of the Good Samaritan. What do we know about this story? Well, we know that if you are called a Good Samaritan, you are being called a loving, helpful, giving person. You are receiving a compliment. We know that we do not want to be those who go out of their way to avoid helping others. And many times the sermons you hear on this story focus on how we can be like the Good Samaritan. But that is not what Jesus wants to teach us. Rather, what our Lord wants to convey to us is how to ask the right question. What do I mean by that, you ask? Well, the wrong question is put before Jesus in today's reading. That is, who is my neighbor? When we ask that question, we are really looking to do, what we're really looking to do is limit the scope of our charity or of our interest. When I was a kid in the 70s, I knew everyone on my block. I was their paper boy, and I was also known as a hard worker who was willing to do yard work cheap on the side. If someone asks me who is my neighbor today, well, I can tell you the names of those living next to me and some who live across the street. It is not my neighborhood that shrunk. Rather, it was my interest that decreased. So if we ask Jesus, who is my neighbor, Jesus is not going to answer. At least, that is not the question Jesus answers in our gospel reading. The question Jesus answers is, whose neighbor am I? For us to get there, we have to know something about the details of this text. The text begins with an important word, behold. Luke is indicating that What is to follow is of great importance when you say the word behold. We are called to give it our undivided attention, yet what Jesus wants us to focus upon seems like a setup to a good joke. Behold what? Behold a lawyer. Lawyers of today do not get a positive world-class reputation. In fact, most lawyers of today are treated with the same contempt as tax collectors were in Jesus' day. The lawyer in today's text is nothing like today's lawyer. This man in our text reminds me more of a seminary student because what this lawyer studied was God's law. He studied the Torah, the law of God given to Moses found in the books, books like Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy. This man was well-schooled. He was a scholar, and not only did he know God's law, he also knew all the commentaries put together by all the learned rabbis over the centuries. They were collected in a thing called the Talmud. So this lawyer was really a biblical scholar, and he comes with a question for Jesus. It's important to note that he is not looking for information. And this is where his connection to a seminary study um, student vanishes. He doesn't expect Jesus to add to his great knowledge. Luke tells us that the lawyer stood up to put Jesus to the test. He wanted to trick Jesus with an answer that would discredit him. He wants to undermine Jesus so he would lose his following. The lawyer thinks this is a very difficult question that no matter how Jesus answers, it's going to be wrong. What's the question? Here you go. 
what must I do to inherit eternal life? Note, Jesus does not answer the question. He poses his own question back at the lawyer. What does the law of God say? What is written in the law? How do you read it? As the lawyer is a classic student and most likely a braggart, he gives a letter perfect answer to this question. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, and with all your might, and with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And I can imagine this lawyer beaming with pride as he said this. Jesus commends him, you have answered well. Do this and you will live. The last part is what trips up the lawyer. In fact, it trips up a lot of Christians as well. There are many sermons out there that teach what we must do. Even the lawyer knows that what Jesus lays on him cannot be done. Sometimes Christians do not realize this truth. Sometimes Christians think that the lawyer's answer can be done. Remember I said he was an intelligent man the lawyer knew better. He knew that we cannot love God in all fullness. There are going to be hiccups. Whenever we fall into such a trap that we can love God in all fullness without anything pulling us away from that effort, then we must pay better attention to a little word in Jesus' dialogue that throws a lug wrench into all our thinking. The word that we often overlook is all. We must love the Lord with all our heart. We must love our neighbor with all the love with which we used to love ourselves. And we must apply that love also to our neighbor. On our own, we just cannot accomplish this mighty task. The lawyer knows it cannot be done because the word all covers everything. Do you think that you can love the Lord with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your strength? Some may think so. Maybe we can do it at one moment, like when we worship and praise the name of our Lord. Maybe then we can give all of our heart to Jesus, but can we do the same to our neighbor and do this all of the time? I asked myself that question, and before I could utter the answer, the word no flooded my every thought. I know that I can partially love my neighbor on my best day. I think the lawyer felt the same. I think at this moment he was wondering how he could get out of this mess that he got himself into. The lawyer was probably recalling the words of Isaiah that says, All our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. Therefore, the lawyer now begins to resemble today's lawyers by doing what I call nitpicking. You know, like maybe he can find a loophole somewhere that will justify his actions or inaction, if you will. Now, he already knew the answer to the question according to his commentaries. The halakha is another such commentary. Lawyers are never supposed to ask a question that they do not know the answer to. According to the halakha, an Israelite was your neighbor, and anyone who is not an Israelite was not your neighbor. It's pretty convenient. Christians might do the same thing by saying, those who are members of my congregation are my neighbor, and those who are not members of my church are not my neighbor, and that includes the guy who lets his dog poop on my front lawn. The lawyer wanted to justify himself, and so he asked the wrong question by saying, who is my neighbor? Jesus answers by telling him a story. Now, right here is every pastor's proof text. When you ask a Lutheran pastor a question, you also get a story. We never give you a, just a simple answer. Don't like that? Well, blame it on Jesus. He was asked a simple question, wasn't he? And so he provides what? A very lengthy story as his response. My poor wife never gets a simple answer from me. Here is the story Jesus told. A certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. By the way, Jerusalem is 25,000 feet above sea level, and Jericho is 1,000 feet below sea level. It is not the best journey to travel. There is a desert and a lot of caves, so it is perfect, a perfect place for someone to get robbed. 
When I lived in New Jersey, I thought of Patterson as much the same way and tried to avoid that area. So what happened to this man is that robbers came upon him. They stripped him and they beat him and they left him for dead. Then by chance, a priest walked by. This is where I put myself in the place of the victim. I imagine seeing a, a priest driving by when my car is broken down in I-35. And of course, I would think to myself, now I will get some help because here is a servant of the Most High Lord. What a blessing. Yet, what did this highly respected servant do? He was probably going home after spending a week in service at the temple. He sees the man, and the Greek language is so specific here. It says that the priest goes out of his way to walk on the other side of the road. So much for the priest being helpful. And I have actually seen a similar event take place in my own life, where I saw somebody who I thought was a man of God completely ignore me when I needed help. Then a Levite passed by. And the Levites were assistants to the priests. They were also highly respected. Maybe we can imagine him to be a vicar, the third year seminary student. He sees a fallen man by the side of the road and does the same thing as the priest. He goes as far away from him as he can. Great, right? Then a Samaritan comes along. One of those with confused religion and so despised by Jews as the Samaritan. In fact, the Jews would not even walk on Samaritan soil. If the Samaritan represented someone today, it would be a Hell's Angels biker. I know if I was thirsty and the only place to get a drink was at a Hell's Angel hangout, I would think twice. Anyway, this Samaritan sees the man and has compassion on him. Notice this word, compassion, is absent from the description of the priest and the Levite. This kindness shown to the fallen man consisted of dressing his wounds, putting him on his own ride, and taking him to a place where shelter was free. It was there that he took care of this man. When he left in the morning, he paid the keeper of the inn, with what was two full days' wages for a laborer. He promised that if more expenses were needed, that he would return to take care of the debt. Wow. So then, with all this in mind, Jesus asks a question. And he asks the right question. Who proved to be a neighbor to the one who fell by the hand of thieves? Jesus still does not answer the question, who is my neighbor, but who proved to be neighbor? Of course, there was only one answer that the lawyer could give. It was the one who showed mercy. Well, right then and there, the lawyer had to realize that status had nothing to do with loving one, loving one's neighbor. He probably also realized that the level of one's education had nothing to do with loving one's neighbor either. He had a ton of education, and he failed miserably right here. When you ask the wrong question, like, who is my neighbor, you cast aside mercy in order to follow law. And what Jesus teaches us here is that it all came down to mercy. When Jesus said, you answered correctly, go and do likewise, he gave the lawyer what he wanted. He gave him law. Funny thing, though, I think at this point in time, the lawyer knew that the Samaritan was seen as a better keeper of the law in God's eyes than this lawyer. At least the Samaritan attached mercy. If mercy is not attached, then our entire lives as Christians will only be about the law. Do this. Do this rather than asking the right question, whose neighbor are we? What is taught constantly in the New Testament is what we are, well, that we are to be neighbors of mercy. Galatians 6 2 tells us to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, when given opportunity, let us do good for everyone. You notice God expects continuous action and response on our part that we will never grow weary of proving or mercy or providing mercy to others so that 
and so often for so many. And this is where I clearly see my own deficiency. It falls in line with what Paul said in Colossians, that he never stopped praying. Oops. Well, there is another failure on my part. Not only do I grow weary in praying, I often pray myself to sleep if I ever get sleep. We are to do thing, these things, provide mercy, especially for those who are of the household of faith. We who are strong have an obligation to bear the failings of the weak. We are also not to please ourselves, but rather to please our neighbor for his good. I fail here as well, as do we all. Jesus said, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Fail. And you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus wants us to be neighbor to the one that is in need. Now, what does all this mean to us this July 10th, 2016? What it means for us is that we ask the right question. Again, I remember or I remind you that neighbor for us can only or often have a very restricted meaning when we live under the law. Who is your neighbor? Is it the person next door or a few houses down the street or across the street? Do you feel that the person who cuts in front of you at Crest Food is your neighbor? How about the one who almost drives you off the road? When we talk about our neighborhood, we do not mean our whole county, do we? Is Kevin Durant, the NBA star who left Oklahoma and the Thunder, still our neighbor? Those are are good questions, but again, the right question is, whose neighbor am I? Because that question does not look for restrictions. So how do we answer that? How do we put into practice that we are neighbor to someone in need? I think we do that when we help with disaster relief, like when the people in Moore needed our help. And there are children from the WizKids program at Faith Lutheran that need our help. There are always people who will need our help wherever we go. Here we respond to Christ's words of go and do likewise. We don't do these things to earn credit from God. We don't do these things so that God will be gracious to us. And we do it because God has already been gracious to us already in the person and work of Jesus Christ. (sighs) Well, how can we be the neighbor God wants us to be? St. Paul gets this together properly in Colossians, beginning in verse 8. Remember, Paul continually asked God to fill the Colossians with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives? Here we see the Spirit is given to us. He gets the credit. We read further. It says, So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son that he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins." You and I are neighbors to Christ. Titus 3.5 says he saved us, not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal in the Holy Spirit. Christ has mercy on us, even when we fail to have mercy on others. Jesus pours out this mercy generously to us so that we do not have to sum up our own mercy. It is already given to us so that it is easily shared by us with those who have need. God's mercy to us, his mercy through us. Whose neighbor am I? We are, it's we who are justified by the grace, our neighbors to all in need. We who are justified by his grace, our neighbors to all 
who are in need. Sometimes I get the dyslexic stuff a little messed up here, so forgive me for that. If, if you think about it, Jesus answered this last question, whose neighbor am I? When he put himself upon the cross to take away the sins of the world. Remember, always to ask the right question and you will respond with Christ's mercy. God's mercy to us, his mercy through us. In the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen.